Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to Musical Talk. I'm Nick Hudson. Robert Gordon, hello. Welcome back to Musical Talk after many, 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 many years. Yes, it seems like... Before you knock your drink off the table, I've been in in isolation, but it started with COVID. And sort of then I haven't quite got back to everything, but I I am going to theatre a lot now. Lovely. And we're going to talk about a myriad of shows today. We're going to start with um, my and my friend Harrison's thoughts on Ain't Too Proud, which is the Temptations musical playing at the Prince Edward Theatre. Um, Harris and I recorded our thoughts before and during the show, but we didn't have time to talk about it afterwards because it's you can't really get a voice recorder out and kind of sit in the theatre recording your thoughts. Um, so we'll, we'll hand over our thoughts. Uh, we'll, we'll hand over to our theatre thoughts, which is another good name for a podcast. <laughs> um, and then uh, we'll come back and I'll discuss the show further with Robert. So taking you to the Prince Edward Theatre now. Well, seeing this show brings me back to many, many years, the early days of Musical Talk when I took Jonathan Curran to see Jersey Boys here. And now from the same creators of Jersey Boys, we have what will probably be a very similar show, Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. I'm here with Harrison. Hello. Hello, Harrison. Hello. There um, are, this will be nothing like Jersey Boys, as there are actually <laughs> five Temptations, whereas there's four Jersey Boys. So, Okay, well, that's, that's one difference we can note. Um, I've seen the preview of the set, it immediately looks better than Jersey Boys, but that's not difficult, considering Jersey Boys took place in a cage. Um, <laughs> you, you kind of mumbled about the show for a bit, haven't you? Uh, yes, I mean, I'm a big motel fa- Motown fan, so I've been looking forward to this. I loved The Drifters Girl. We know. Went to see it three times. Um, Might this be the new Drifters Girl for you, do you think? I doubt it, because I'm not as much of a fan as of, of The Temptations as I am The Drifters, but um, no, it'll still be a good show. The set does look very good. Yeah. Um, um, and that's all we have to say about it, really. We don't know much about it. So we're from Broadway. We've seen the... Uh, Mary Poppins had to close for this, so it better be good. We've seen the song list. Yeah. And my God, is it long. It's two hours, 40 minutes with an interval, which is generally pretty standard, so it should be over by 10.30, 10.20. But hopefully, like these shows do, they'll move things along very quickly. They're just telling us the house is open, which is what we like to hear. Good start to the evening. (laughs) And we'll let you know our thoughts as the evening progresses. But uh, look out, baby, because here we come. I need to get my Vanessa Phelps joke in now. Should you wait till after? So, act one of... I was going to say The Drifters Girl, but it's actually called um, Ain't Too Proud, has come to an end, (laughs) finally. Um, And it's good, the band are amazing, the cast is good, the design is a thing that exists. Um, Black and white. But I just think it just seems like a bit of a parody of a jukebox musical. Not in a bad way, it's just it's doing the same thing that Jersey Boys does, it's doing the same thing that The Drifters Girl does, even though that was about the manager, not, about, not so much about the band. You know, they sing a song that we all know and love, then, it's, then it stops a bit, they have a beat that goes behind it, yeah. and then it kind of carries on, and then someone, something happens, and then something else... It, is that just me, Harrison? Or? I think that bass player must be sick of playing the My Girl Rift because it's, it's most of the show is just do 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 yeah. do do do. We had to leave him behind because he was on drugs. We brought in this person. We were very lucky because we found the head of Motel. Yeah. Uh, but then this person was on drugs, so we kicked him out. But we brought this person in who turned out to be on drugs. So we kicked. Uh, it, the thing is, it's. We, we've, had a bit of, we've had a bit of drama with the racial issues that are going to be more prevalent in Act 2, which is good, because more needs to happen. 
Um, but we've had Motown in the West End. We have. We've had yeah. Drifters Girl. We've had Jersey Boys. We've got two. Mike, we've had old Michael Jackson show. Then a new one is coming in at some point. <laughs> so how many more? How many more of these do we need? I think there's been more Motown in the West End than have been musicals in the last twenty years. I think so. Yeah. I must say it's audience-wise somewhat very well behaved. <laughs> one woman is like throwing her hands in the air and waving about yeah. and dancing, but. Overall, there's no Vanessa Feltz, there's no uh, Dermot O'Leary's. Yeah, it's quite pleasant. Um, yeah. The, the, let's talk about the, the, the scenography of the show, the design. It's very black and white. I want more colour in it. Uh, maybe that will happen in the Fulani, I don't know. But it's obviously a choice they've made. And there's some clever use of projection mapping and projection masking going on, which I'm quite enjoying. Um, not much of a set that it kind of teases it at the beginning with quite a beautiful set of the front of a theatre which comes back again and again and again and again yeah. um, and it's kind of it does that same thing that all these shows do where they have here's a place name that you kind yes. of can't read I mean I don't want to be negative about it because I want to like it and I'm not it's not negativity it's more just we've seen we've this seen it before <laughs> it's been done before hmm. It'll be done again. But this is done, even though we say that, this is, this is done to a very high standard. The cast are amazing. But Jersey Boys, at least, it had different perspectives of the story. Yeah, I've still not seen it. Okay. I need to, but... So each person in Jersey Boys narrates their own version of what okay. happened. Whereas yeah. here, it's just the, the, the Otis. Lead, lead Otis, the leader of the Temptations, says what's happening. There's a scene, there's a song. Repeat, 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 yes. repeat, repeat, repeat. And the songs are brilliant, as I said. The band are brilliant. Um, I would hate to be on a Saturday night, though. Well, it might it be more be lively. No. Oh, you know, way. part of the thing about a lot of these shows is they rely on the audience having a bit of a... I'm not going to say a sing-along, because that is not allowed. But, you know, it, it's a very muted audience tonight. Uh, it is a Wednesday. We're very grateful to be here, so thank you. But um, it might be more exciting A once reviews come out and more people hear about this show it's still very early in its inception but it's in a very very tight um, uh, place they're very they have they are working their metaphorical buttocks off in this production there's one very good what I do like is the uh, track across the stage yeah it's bringing a especially it got a laugh they have a uh, almost like a board and someone would stand on it and they'd say it was time for him to go and then yeah, he'd just get wheeled just off the stage very fast gl- gl- glided off the stage yeah, didn't he yeah. which is quite fun um, it needs more laughs I think but can you really have laughs in a story about the temptations not really no I mean there are, there are a few it's towards the start yeah um, but inter- we're interested to see what happens in Act 2 whether the, uh, it throws any theatrical surprises at us I doubt it will Um, But if you do love these kind of shows, this is a perfect one to come and see because it does everything these kind of shows are meant to do. It does it by the book. Exactly. It's very... We've said it about ten times now, but it's very... You just sit back and enjoy it, don't you? Yes. There's a song, someone will get kicked out, or some sort of drama. Uh, A girl will appear, or pregnancy, or... A girl, or pregnancy, or a fight, or drugs. Hmm. And then something will happen... The lead will narrate it over the bass line of their most famous song, or the last song that was playing. Or well, the song that's currently playing. Yes, and then they'll just go back to singing the song, and then end of scene. Yeah. It, there's um, no consequence to what happens, and I know it's hard because it's uh, based off of real events. Life. It's not It's not a story, but it just feels like there is no consequence <laughs> to any action in the musical. And this is the problem with these kind of musicals is it is a musical, sort of, but the songs aren't moving the story forward. They try and take a couple of songs and relate them to the drama, but it just doesn't work because you're not getting a real musical dramatist to sit down and write these songs that move the story forward. So whilst you're enjoying the songs, you just want more to happen, really. But anyway, um, we will reconvene after Act 2 and uh, share our final thoughts but thank you Harrison no worries and, thank uh, you well, you know we're not too proud here on well, Music Talk too. we ain't too proud even here on Music Talk yes. no. but um, we'll carry on with our thoughts later Ooh. okay so there are um, kind of the pre and um, mid show thoughts um, 
Harrison and I spoke the day after the show and we couldn't remember one thing about it. <laughs> which is a real shame because the cast are excellent, the band are excellent. Um, but it, it, as we say, it's just it just seems like a parody of a jukebox musical. You know, these kind of very formulaic band meeting, breaking up, f- finding other members, narrator... It all kind of veered slightly on cliche, but the songs are good. I'm not a massive Temptations, I don't want to say fan, because I enjoy the songs I do know, but I don't know a lot of them. And I think that kind of tempered my enjoyment of it, if you can understand. Yeah, I, I, I think, it, look, I haven't seen the show. I've just seen a few clips on, on YouTube. And I felt straight away, when just seeing a couple of them, that it... The music seemed a bit samey. Now, mm. I do like Motown. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't a particular fan of The Temptations, though every now and again, you know, I loved one or two of their songs. But I thought the thing about The Temptations, from what I can remember, is they're a very even-paced, even, you know, evenly balanced group as a group. Uh, I mean, they weren't like, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, the parallel group, obviously, is uh, the Supremes. Now, oh, but they feature in it as well. OK, but Diana Ross and the Supremes, they because they feature Diana Ross as the sort of star, even when it was just the Supremes, they felt more varied. And the songs that were written for them, I think, were a bit more varied. Mm. Um, there are a few Temptation songs, like My Girl, mm. which stand out. But I think a lot of the songs, and also the dance routines they did originally, were very samey because it was step, step, turn, step, step, yeah. turn, kick, kick, kick. Now, I wonder, what, what was the choreography like? Or was it just very much that sort of it, TV, you know, I mean, show the, the, the type? Pro- the problem I have with these shows is they're not musicals. They are plays, very much plays with often, is that word again, diegetic songs. And there's nothing to really mirror the songs when it comes to any story happening because it's more like story, song, story, during a song. Mm. And then you get half a song, then a beat comes in with a bass player playing things, and then there's the narrator's... So is it all. biographical? I mean, does yeah, it tell absolutely. you their story? Yeah, from yeah, the very yeah. beginning to the end. And we've we've seen that with Jersey Boys. We've seen it with... So many shows. So many shows. Buddy Holly, I mean, years ago. Yeah, and um, I mean, Harrison refers to the Drifters Girl in when we chat about it, but at least that has the story of this person we don't know much about, you know, the, the, the manager of the Drifters. Um, and who really cares about the life story of the Temptations? <laughs> it's such a strange thing. And, and we had Motown here and on Broadway, and that's the same... It features the same character in it, mm, mm. you know, and it's just kind of like, I don't see what the point of the show is, but a certain demographic demographic of audience loved it. What, well, older people? Older people. Um, who were of, around in the yeah, 60s. Yeah, who, who, who loved it, but just go and see The Temptations. They're probably still performing yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, and your ticket will probably be cheaper as well. I agree. And yeah. you'll get less dialogue and less na- narration thrown in your face, and that's what kind of really annoyed me was... The narration, it's just lazy. Yes. Um, yes. No, I, I found the same with Jersey Boys when it when it first came out in London, you know, when it first produced in London. I, I just found, who cares about the story of the Jersey Boys? I love some of their songs, mm. but who cares about this story? And it's so poorly dramatised, so weakly dramatised, mm. that I, I wasn't interested. i tell you what I think, because two shows that have been running recently, one of which is still running... Uh, I I did quite like Beautiful. I mean, I still have a criticism because it's in the same format of telling the biography of, but, you know, not not actually dramatising But that was clever poorly. because when she was having her... Um, her relationship was falling apart at the end of Act One, she actually sings, and I forget the song, which is very embarrassing, but... Um, um, well, it was a, it was a while ago, Dick, and you're yeah. not as old as, <laughs> not as I am. sharp so, as I so, used to be. Yeah. Um, but, but it did mirror what's happening on stage. Yes, and no, it, absolutely. And it then becomes, is this a live, uh, is she performing this, or is this, is this dreary on a musical? Uh, and they inserted the songs at various points when, for example, it was important to tell the biography, because, you know, there were certain things about the writing and the uh, producing of certain songs where the drama was there in the making of that song. And yeah. it had humour, and it had jokes yeah. I still yeah. remember. For yeah. example, when Little Eva does the locomotion, 
she's her nanny. Yes. And she said, well, even the nanny's getting her hit songs yes. now and, yes. and stuff. So. No, no, I, I, I think that was much better dramatised than what you've explained. Mm. But also, the Tina Turner show, uh, Tina the Musical, Tina Turner the Musical, but for various reasons. First of all, it did signal, I mean, we know that Tina Turner has quite quietly just stopped performing, uh, stopped doing concerts. Um, Tina Turner was still is, in people's minds, a huge, a megastar of rock. Um, she had a most varied career and an incredibly complex and uh, traumatic, in some ways, life. So that the story in itself, just actually standing and recounting the story of Tina Turner's life, is interesting in itself. So to go back to her early past, to, you know, to her childhood, and then show how she met Ike and the abusive relationship... It really doesn't matter that much that the songs don't always dramatise the story. Mm. They do insofar as while she's creating certain songs, surprise, surprise, what we don't realise as, as, as <laughs> listeners is um, that, in fact, she's being abused by Ike at the very mm. same moment. And I had no idea about how she was taken for a ride financially in the earlier part of her career and how she then had to do play hotels and things like that to claw her way back up. Uh, so by the time... I mean, it really is like one of those musicals where the old-fashioned musicals where she finally becomes uh, a megastar, you know, uh, towards the end of the show. And you really cheer for her because you have got to understand her, you've got to understand her life... The other thing is it gives an opportunity. There are so many great women singers and so many uh, uh, great black women singers around today. And the, the, the woman I saw, and I'm sorry, I forgot, I've seen it twice, but the first woman I saw, uh, they were both good, but the first one I saw who was the, the originator of the, of the role in London was absolutely superb. And you weren't disappointed that she wasn't Tina Turner. Now, I've seen Tina Turner live and she's incomparable. But to, to actually cast someone who can almost do the same thing is, is remarkable. And I think um, th that's another reason why I think that works and why it's still running. I'll be very interested to see how long the uh, A2 Proud runs. Um, I mean, I suspect it will run because I'm afraid audiences are very, very lax in their judgment. It's their favourite group, perhaps, yeah. whoever goes, and they're seeing in it, and it, and it's just like um, one of those, uh, uh, what do you call them, the copy shows, the ones that go around. Tribute shows. Tribute shows. Yeah. It's like a tribute Yeah, I mean, show. but, again, it's, it's a big theatre being filled, which is lovely, what we like to see. So, um, Ain't You Proud is playing at the... Prince Edward Theatre, which is funny enough where Jersey Boys played. I, I want to quickly divert away from the shows, Robert, and just mention, um, we should probably mention Barry Humphreys, and we should probably mention uh -huh. um, Paul O'Grady as well. Yes. Um, very, and, and also uh, um, Len, his name, I can't remember, Len Goodman? from Strictly, who's also died. Yes, um, a lot of show business... Well, he wasn't exactly a legend, Len, but but the other two were. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was sad, and in a, in a funny kind of way, the fact that we lost uh, Paul O'Grady first, and he was younger. I mean, he wasn't at an age where you really expect someone to die. Um, OK, I think... Um, uh, Barry Humphreys was 89, and so it's not unusual yeah. for someone to die at 89. But um, I thought that the two there's two people who could be said to be drag queens, mm. but were that... It was and, so convincing. And so much more, yes, yes, because as female impersonators, although both were grotesque, they were trying to be feminine women, um, but they did... In an odd kind of way, they were almost feminist in their in their representations of women because they used these women as powerful, tough figures do, who, do, who completely dominated men. Do you think Paul O'Grady was very much inspired by Dame Edna? I wonder. It's an interesting question. Uh, possibly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, OK, the difference was that um, Barry Humphreys was really an intellectual and, a, and a, a, a sort of an artist in some ways, a sort of surrealist. But as a performer, when he played Dame Edna... It really, I mean, the closest thing to Dame Edna was Lily Savage. They were in different styles, they were in different milieu, um, but um, 
Paul or Greg? I never thought I'd hear the word milieu. And, and, uh, <laughs> well, there you are. I'm an academic. Lenny Savage in the same. I, I'm, I'm an academic. But 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 you see, um, the, the one was Liverpool. And the uh, and the other was Australia, uh, Melbourne, Melbourne housewife, wasn't she? Melbourne yeah. housewife. So um, of course that was different. But in their specific social environments, each one, each of those performers did it perfectly. They knew it. They were from there, uh, you know, from those two, two different locations, and they got it perfectly. And I mean, it. I mean, the thing is that it, it's really unfair to Australians, if you, if you think about it, because Barry Humphreys nailed that sort of person so well that we tend to think that Dame Edna and Len, uh, you know, Sir Len, uh, uh, um, were, were absolutely what Australia is. And of course, That's it, the two kind of Australians. Of course, and of course Australians, you know, there's, there's in general, uh, Australians are nothing like that. And I, I have great respect for Australians who are quite direct and straightforward and, and, and honest mm. as, as people, if you can make these sort of generalisations. But those two, they became for us sort of icons of, of Australian culture. And I think that's remarkable. And I think, I think with Lily Savage, it's slightly different but he is nailing a certain kind of frankness and honesty and directness of... Um, because he was so nice as a person, wasn't yes, he? And that's always yes. the thing with kind of people that yes. create take on these very cruel... Um, I mean, Dame Ed, Was Dame Edna cruel? I don't no, think. definitely. But Dame Edna was kind of very... very um, yes, so was Lily Savage. Yeah. The name, Savage. Um, but they did musicals as well. Uh, Barry Humphreys did Oliver originally, I think. Yes. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Well, that was before the Dame Edna took off. Yes. Yeah. And, and Barry, in 1960. Then, then he did it again when it came to the play. Then he played Fagin. But and, he'd originally played Mr. Sowerberry, The Undertaker. Okay. Uh, and the lovely song, He's a Born Undertaker, Cause Mute. Yeah. Uh, the I funeral can see him in his song. Black silk suit. <laughs> exactly. It's, uh, it's, it's the, never in the shows. Anymore. That's your funeral. Yeah. yeah, it's a pity because it's a great number. But. Um, Paul O'Grady did. Annie afterwards. Annie, yeah. In a way, almost as Lily Savage. Yeah. Um, but I think what's interesting is that Lily Savage had that kind of directness and embodied that kind of directness of the northerner, the typical northerner, as it, you know, as a stereotype. Mm. But, as you say, there was some warmth there. And there was also the sort of realism. I mean, this is what was very different from Dame Edna, because she had, Lily, Lily had a sort of warmth and self, an honesty about herself so that she was she was not just making jokes at other people's expense. She was always using her own experience, you know, and sort of sending herself up a little bit as she sent other people up. But, of course, she was savage, you know. In, in, I mean, I have a little anecdote. It's just, it just uh, I, I had a friend, uh, sadly, uh, who died a few years ago called Flora. It was a very theatrical woman who had been an actress. And her husband... The second husband, uh, Stan, was a very big, tall, bluff uh, 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 Yorkshireman. And Flora used to narrate, you know, I mean, because Flora had a very theatrical voice. And she used to narrate stories about how, one of the stories that she used to narrate was how Stan, this big Yorkshireman, uh, met Lily Savage at an art exhibition. And I think, I think Paul O'Grady had something to do with maybe the character was an exhibit or something. But anyway, uh, Flora said, uh, well, we met Lily Savage and he was, she was almost as tall as Stan. Um, and she came up to Stan and Stan said, hello, Lily, I'm, I'm a Yorkshireman too, you know. And Lily said, oh, hello, Stan. And she said, we were a bit taken aback that Lily's voice was deeper than Stan's. And I always remember that because I think one of the things that was appealing about Paula Grady slash Lily Savage was that the Lily Savage character was really quite gruff. And I think that's, again, it was questioning the barriers, the boundaries between macho men who are supposed to have all this gruffness and tough older women mm. who can be even stronger and tougher. Well, was he the first big British drag performer? Oh, no, 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 no. No, I mean, I mean the biggest Danny British Leroux, yeah. drag performer still probably in history is Danny LaRue, but that was a very different kind of drag because Danny LaRue had no... Pun. Danny LaRue couldn't come on as a female character and do a, do a chat show. Mm. Um, but I think the interesting thing was the way the audience loved Paula Grady when he was Paula Grady, when he was no longer Lily Savage, because I thought most people thought, and his advisors thought, 
he would disappear as a, as a performer. But it, obviously the audience had latched on to something kind, warm and open about him. And so he didn't always come on... I mean, he didn't specially come on in his male persona as Paul O'Grady as a gay man. He didn't, he didn't make mm-hmm. being queer, being a queen, if you like, the, the, the basis of that act, the way, for example... Um, um, You've got to help me out here. Graham Norton does it. No, no. Um, um, the guy who's uh, in pantomime every year. Um, Julian Clary. Julian Clary. Julian Clary is a camp gay man. Is he? Well, he I plays, he plays the role. Uh, I don't think he is that camp in real life, but he plays the role of a queen. He's also got quite a deep voice now. Mm. But he play, he's always has. Um, and Paul O'Grady, once he was Paul O'Grady, didn't do that. No. And I think what's interesting... That, that's interesting, because I think it becomes part of that period where the acceptance of gay people became widespread. And Paul O'Grady is one of those ambassadors, if you like. And though he worked very hard for gay causes, he also wor- worked very hard for dogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and and um, it's interesting, because British people love animals, love pets. And especially dogs. Especially dogs. And, and Paul O'Grady had this double interest in his charity work and I think that was very very English yeah. because at a time when English people were thinking oh well what's really the difference well, 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 you know there's not such a huge difference and, and also it was a nice refreshing change from Lily Savage yes to see the real person behind uh, yes thinking how, how lovely he must be I think that's and uh, for, for me that when there was a great um he had Alan Menken on his show yes and um it, it, you could just tell he was a, a massive fan of Alan's stuff because he was asking all these questions that weren't normal. Yes. And, get, and then he performed, he broke into Poor Unfortunate Souls. Mm-hmm. And I actually told Alan last week that we've, we'd lost Paul O'Grady and he immediately replied to my email saying, oh my God, that's, that's really sad. I'm so, so sorry. So yes. how he wasn't yes. such a loved yes. part of British yes. culture. Yes. Um, well, I, I, I don't think... Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I think you've got it just right about Paul O'Grady. Uh, I don't think um, um, Barry Humphreys was loved in the same way because he was a too complex figure. Mm. You, you know, he was a very complex figure and more obviously an actor than yeah. than Paul O'Grady. But, but an excellent performer. But Yeah, but the Edna Everidge character was adored for her nastiness. I mean, there, there's a... I, I, my, my family came around on Sunday and we all watched the Parkinson interview with Sharon Osbourne and Judy Dench. And they just sit back on their chairs and watch her for 20 minutes just completely improvise. Yes. The funniest stuff yes. you've heard yes. and the cruelest but yes. kindest. Yes. You know, it's so nice to be on this That's show, right. Michael. If you call it a show, <laughs> you know, and all that it's, kind of... It's, it's instantaneous improvisation. And that's where, and it's another thing that was common about both of them, mm. that they could both... I mean, I was surprised watching <coughs> Paul O'Grady improvising and being incredibly funny. So both um, Barry Humphreys and uh, um, uh, Paul O'Grady, whether they were in role or not, were very, very quick-witted. Yeah. And that's what's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking to us about that. Tell us about what else you've been... Because there's two shows you've been wanting to talk about for ages on Musical Talk. Yes. Well, I'm <coughs> kind of banging a drum, if that can be the right sort of metaphor. I'm banging a drum for one show in particular, and that's Sylvia by Kate Prince and uh, Priya Palmar, Palmar um, with the music by Josh Cohen and DJ Wold. I don't know... Uh, Josh Cohen or DJ Wald, but um, I do know Kate Prince and know her work, and it's wonderful. And this is, I, this is at the Old Vic, isn't it? Sylvia, it was at the Old Vic. Was I it? think it's, the run has come to an end now. I think it's very sad. I think the critics have treated it very poorly. I think, personally, and one or two of my colleagues, academic colleagues, think this is the best new British show almost since... Uh, Billy Elliot. Now, I think that's probably the greatest British musical ever, though one should never make those. Over Matilda? So, uh, Matilda too, but, you, okay. you know, uh, Billy Elliot has some level of seriousness which Matilda doesn't have. They're, they're both brilliantly crafted. And, um, I, but I think this is the most original British musical to have come out since, let's say, Matilda. Um, because 
So it, would, would the obvious comparison be here to six? Yes. Oh, I think it's it's incomparably better than six. I know people are going to hate me for saying that because I know with younger people especially, six is a, is a kind of iconic show. Mm. I think six is quite clever, but I don't think it's iconic. And I think six, six um, completely... Is this more of a musical than six is? Definitely. Right. Uh, um, but, it, but yes, because it, there's, there's real uh, storytelling involved. With six, the storytelling is rather weak actually but also the the sense of history in six I, d- I don't expect it to be historically you know naturalistic realistic in a way but one does expect it to have a point of view about those women and actually these women were not uh, uh, uh you know powerful women as is made out in the show mm. they were just people who were victims of a, of a, a misogynist really um uh, but but sylvia tells the story of uh, Sylvia Pankhurst and her mother, the more famous Emmeline Pankhurst, who everybody's heard of, Mrs. Pankhurst, refers uh, is is who how we refer to her. Um, but Sylvia, uh, Mrs. Pankhurst, Emily, Emily Pankhurst, played by Beverly Knight, and um, the Drifters girl. Oh well, yeah, well yeah. there you are, uh, and um, um, her daughter. Um, Sylvia, played by Sharon Rose, a remarkable performance. Um, and the, the show I would compare it with most is Hamilton, mm-hmm. because it tries to do almost exactly the same thing, but wait for it, I think it does so, it better. So you did there. That's very clever. I think it does it better, because it is genuinely historical. The production uses uh, sort of epic theatre techniques of, you know, putting the dates and times and occasions of all the different important events in the show. And you'd think it would be didactic, but it's not. It's informative. You don't, you never think I'm being lectured at. Uh, It's all written in rap and a little bit of sort of, I'd say, soul music. I'm not a great rap fan. I'm too old, although I, I can listen to witty rappers singing. But this, I love the music. You don't like Gilbert and Sullivan? Well, I suppose they are rap, yes, in their own 19th century way. But the, um, I, I love the music. I sat there because it's so appropriate to what they're trying to do. And here is one show where I felt the deliberate mismatch, just like in Six, though, which where I don't think it really works. But here, the deliberate mismatch between um, uh, the song and the songs and the music, the, 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 the score, and... The story is very witty, and it makes you really listen. I mean, to have on stage a black, slightly bearded, cool uh, character, young black actor, playing Winston Churchill is absolutely brilliant, because Mm. A, it shocks you how misogynistic Winston Churchill was. B, I didn't know that his wife, uh, uh, Winnie, was uh, really a kind of a feminist in those days. And... That's why the Tory press hated it. Um, I, I, I think th- this is something that really Tories shouldn't hate. It's not something that e- every Conservative person would hate. But being as right-wing as our Tory press is, we knew. Uh, my colleague said to me immediately when we saw it, he said, this is going to be slaughtered by the right-wing press because uh, it, it presents w- w- Winston Churchill in the guise of a black man. And of course, this, the actor was beautiful, was lovely, had a had a wonderful, you know, uh, received pronunciation voice, and it was very clever. And it was that's the other thing about the cast. Like Hamilton, it was multi ethnic and uh, and mixed race. You know, so you had all sorts of, of ethnicities uh, pl- actors playing what what obviously could only have been white people in the in history, but. That didn't, added didn't matter. Didn't matter. But what was good about it was unlike. Um, so, sorry to interrupt. I, I, I see. Uh, Kate Prince has done book, lyrics, direction, and choreography. Yes. Are uh, they all good or are they all excellent? Excellent. I mean, so Kate, she's a new. She, look, I mean, I, she's I, new, I, I but she, she to musical theatre. But she's a very experienced and very, very highly rated choreographer. Okay. She has her own company, Zoo Nation, and they did Into the Hoods, that right. version of Sondheim's, the rap version of Sondheim's uh, uh, Into the Woods. Um, 
no, excellent in every way. But I, w what I would say makes this, to me, a better show than Hamilton is it doesn't distort history. To me, Hamilton is fun in a way, interesting in a way, different in a way, but it's a lie because it, the way it's been received, and I think it was intended, is that this completely multi-ethnic cast uh, represent the founding fathers of America and it suggests to the audience that this is the new America. Now we don't have, you know, whites only. And actually that obscures the reality because the reality was that almost everybody, I mean, 99% of Americans who were involved in writing the Constitution were white. They were all slave owners, including Hamilton. And none of this... It is made clear by the musical, and I think that's actually cheating. I think everyone comes out saying, yeah, yeah, feel good, great time, America's liberated, and look at America today. And I think, I think that's why Hamilton is a, is a feel-good musical that wants you to believe that everything in America is getting better and better, and aren't we clever than we're, and, and good that we're so multi-ethnic and so embracing of all sorts of ethnicities, but we ain't. Mm. Whereas... I mean, the cheers that greeted it was always, I saw it twice, the cheers that greeted um, Sylvia um, from the audience, and it wasn't an all-women audience by any means, it, there was a lot of men in the audience, but the cheers that greeted uh, uh, that show, I remember immediately, early, right from the beginning, because people in the audience were saying, this is a story that has to be told. It shows us the misogyny behind the denial of women's rights. And it shows us, um, you know, what we have to celebrate as we move towards equality. We don't have equality, mm -hmm. but as we move towards equality. And it wasn't a, a sort of primly, moralistically, politically co correct show that tried to make the audience hate men. I mean, it wasn't that at all. It, 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 it was just joyous. And But weren't the... Um Weren't the suffragettes incredibly violent sometimes? Well, that's what the musical showed. They weren't violent in the sense that they hit really... people with chains or something, I heard. Or... No, 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 they didn't hit people with chains. <laughs> One of the women, uh, famous women, chained herself to a lamppost. Um, uh, Emily Davison, a very famous woman, threw herself under a horse at, 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 at Epsom, or, or I think it was Epsom, mm. uh, Derby, uh, and that became very famous. They were martyrs. They, they were violent only in the sense that they refused to eat when they were put into prison, including Sylvia herself, and they were force fed. Um, and um, no, they, they weren't, they, they, they weren't, uh, uh, you know, they, they did riot, but it wasn't, you know, the way we'd see a riot where people have got guns and they, and they shoot her, you know, it was, it was quite straightforward. Um, but what I want to say is a shout out for two extraordinary performances. The one as Emily Pankhurst from Beverly Knight, in a way, the supporting character, but a very large role, was brilliantly sung, as one would expect from Be Beverly Knight, was virtuoso. But I think in a way even more impressive was the woman who played Sylvia, Sharon Rose. Now, I don't know her. She seems She's new to me. She's quite a young performer. I thought both her acting and her singing were remarkable. She acts as a singer, which so few, even good singers, can do that well and that was a revelation to me I mean the whole cast were good mm. but I think that that those two performances stand out and it was right that uh, um, Beverly Knight got the best supporting uh, Olivier but I think there should have been another some kind of nod to uh, it, it, Sharon Rose it, it sounds like you went into this show originally with low expectation absolutely and you left on top of the world which is uh, that's always a great Absolutely. feeling with... with I, I, I went in thinking, I'm not going to like this. It's a rap show to appeal to young people. It's mm -hmm. going to be like Hamilton, but it's going to distort the facts. And I came out thinking... This is wonderful. And I loved it on every level, not just politically. I absolutely enjoyed the choreography. Simple, in a way. But you can see this woman is... Uh, what should I say? Not a master choreographer, but a mistress choreographer. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, Katie Prince is... Okay. Uh, I keep thinking you're going to say Katie Price, which um, <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on Operation Mincemeat at some point. Yeah, because I that's seen it, that's but... very, very strong as well. Um, 
Let's move on to the show that did win the Olivier Award for Best Musical. Yes. Um, which and is I, I saw them in the same... Standing at the Sky's Edge. I saw them in the same week. I liked Standing at the Sky's Edge a lot. I wouldn't... I mean, going back to your talk about, you know, your discussion uh, about uh, jukebox musicals, in a way, Standing at the Sky's Edge is more a jukebox musical mm. than a real musical. Okay. I think it's very effective. I loved the politics of it because it doesn't take... It's it's sort of teasing and unsettling in terms of its politics, rather than blaming anybody. You know, it doesn't it doesn't just take this is a socialist point of view on 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 the reality. It just shows you what's happened politically, and it also uses sort of Brechtian or epic techniques in that it keeps showing you the dates when some of the scenes are taking place, and it shifts. like Temptations. Well, okay, but I think more sophisticated. But it shifts about, but. Um, I, I, it looks like a flat, doesn't it? Is, is in your. It's look. a beautiful dis, uh, uh, d- set design, evoking a block of flats, a sixties, a sort of sixties mm. block, which has been tarted up and poshed up and refurbished uh, in the two thousand and tens for now for people to buy. So it's wealthier people who buy it, and in a sense, the council tenants have more or less moved out by this time. And it shows you how it goes through a period of complete dereliction uh, while the council t- tenants are there and how gradually even council tenants refuse to live there and how it therefore has to be um, made to appeal to partial people because it's got this wonderful view. And that's why, you know, Standing at the Sky's Edge is the title. Uh, I thought the cast were pretty good. Almost all of them were, were excellent, excellent singers, good actors. I thought some of the characters were very two-dimensional, like there's, there's two uh, lesbian characters um, and they're in the more contemporary scenes and I thought that was, in the writing, rather lazy. Um, I think the conception is good. I think the set is stunning. I think the music is terrific, but it is already written music it's mm. it's uh, i'm trying to find who, who was the composer but there isn't one so well there is uh, okay uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be the composer in the sense of yeah. um it's an orchestrator and arranger uh, and stuff but no but, 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 but actually the music was originally written by and richard with, hawley music richard, and richard hawley yes the songs were written by richard hawley so they are so he's to some whole, people he, he's already written. known so and the other the, sorry the other thing is that this, he's a Sheffield person. So these are, this is Sheffield score, if you like. It's a Sheffield score. And the, the play was written by uh, a man from Sheffield. And so, done at the Crucible. And done at the Crucible first. Uh, so um, the, the, um, it, it's, it's really very much based on its uh, location and, and its origin and its, and its origination. Again, like um, Sylvia, it's, origin in real history. I mean, it is a real building, and this is what happened to it. So I think for all that, it must be commended, and it's very entertaining. Um, but as I say, I, I think it's in its own, in a way, it's more superficial and less original than um, the people than loved than it. Sylvia. Oh, uh, the audiences have loved it, and I can see why. Uh, I love the music. It, it's interesting, and thank you for telling me about that. But it's interesting. There's a at the beginning of this program. There's a um, kind of this is what's coming in winter 2023, and they've omitted one show for which I'm very excited, which I've been waiting for years to open at the National. And we're finally getting the Witches, the musical, yes, which is coming, and it's been development in their New York workshop, which I didn't even know they had. As House said, it's harder than National Theatre, and if they got a bloody American workshop, um, but. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Robert? Are you, are you... I'm sceptical. Yeah. And I'm sceptical because every single musical that the National have developed, every single original musical have developed in their workshop, has been virtually a disaster in okay. my view. I mean, I thought the worst was The Light Princess, I have yes, to say that's that. Yes, dreadful. Um, you know, lyrics that... Did you see Hex? I didn't see Hex because of my experience with The Light Princess, so I didn't want to go. But I've been, probably that was even worse. Did you see it? No. 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 Okay. Well, we're old and wise. But I... We're I, old, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, okay. Um, I think that... 
You're old. I, I'm old. You're wise. That's on top of that. <laughs> okay, I, but I, I Thank think you for that. the source material for me is what's most exciting and, and of the, course. the staging opportunities. And that's where the national are good. Somebody the, should do it, but it should be somebody like Matthew Warchus, yeah. not, not Rufus Norris. I don't think Rufus Norris is involved. Oh, OK. But whoever he's got to direct it. We'll find um, out. You OK. Can find but uh, can I just give a shout out? The, do, the yeah. author of the book, to go back to uh, Sylvia, uh, sorry, Standing at the Sky's Edge, is Chris Bush, uh, who's a playwright. So, yes, I think that that um, it's an interesting idea. I hope they do it well. Uh, I have my doubts about that. Mm. So, it's book and lyrics by Olivier Award winner Lucy Kirkwood. Oh, good playwright. Music yes. and lyrics by Tony Award nominee Dave Malloy and directed by Lindsay Turner. So okay, I'm well... Glad to I, hear Rufus Norris is nowhere near this production. Yeah, okay. I, I used to really be a, a fan of Rufus Norris, especially his cabaret production, yeah, yeah. but I don't think... I think he's made too many missteps at the National. Um, uh, but I think that um, uh, Lucy Kirkwood is a really good and interesting playwright, and I think her part of it will, will be interesting. And it's at the Olivier, so they have... Let's the... see if she lives up to Dennis Kelly. Yes, we'll see. But thank you, Robert, so much for talking about all these shows. My pleasure. Um, we'll have you on again soon. Go and see Operation oh, Meets Meet. Can I say one, one other thing? thing? Yeah. Um, you might not want to use this, but I have to do a really big shout-out for Sasha Reagan's huge production in the tiniest theatre in London, The Union. And it's the first, I think... Union Theatre production, the one that's actually originated at the Union for ages, since, since COVID. And Sasha, as per normal, has come up with the most amazing and funny and moving production of George Stiles and Anthony, Anthony Drew. Drew's uh, show, Betty Blue Eyes. This is a show that was that closed after about six months and shouldn't have. It should have run six years. But... This production shows how brilliant it is. And working with all the limitations that she had, she's produced an intimate, moving and hilarious show. And it is an intimate, moving and hilarious musical. Mm. So it's too late to go and see it, but maybe they'll revive it. Hopefully. And by the way, Dave Malloy from The Witches, he did The Great Comet. Oh, yes, yes, I, I, now I recall that. Yeah, yes. so we... So maybe, of, may, may, maybe it'll be something, something good. Yes, lots of stuff to look forward to. Robert, thank you so much. We'll have you on again soon. And uh, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Musical Talk. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Musical Talk. To find out more about the world of Musical Talk, you can visit our website at musicaltalk.co.uk where you'll find all our episodes or you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or YouTube. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Musical Talk.